Thank you all very much for joining us for the launch of All For All here in New York. Uh, we will play you a couple of videos now just to get you in the mood and I'll be back shortly to give you a, a heads up as to what's coming up. The world has never been so rich, but we're still susceptible to shocks and crises. Can we build more resilient societies? Not utopian, but functioning and fair. This is the story of Earth for All. We assembled a group of economic thinkers and scientists and developed a computer model to test their big ideas. We then asked, what's possible in one generation? If we carry on as normal, population and material footprints continue to grow, particularly due to overconsumption in rich countries. The gap between the richest and everyone else widens. Social tensions worsen climate change impacts become ever worse. But what if the world takes a giant leap now with five extraordinary turnarounds? In this possible and plausible future, all people can live a good life within safer planetary boundaries. We avoid the worst climate impacts. Poverty ends earlier. Population peaks lower. Well-being rises. Social tensions fall. Nature starts to heal. Incredibly, the investment needed is only 2 to 4% of global income. But we do need massive investments now, driven by governments on a clear mission to enact the turnarounds. Another big idea is a citizens fund for each country where companies pay to use our commons, the wealthiest contribute fairly and the funds are distributed to all citizens equally. But rebooting economies won't happen on its own. We need a global movement kicked off with worldwide citizens assemblies. This is Earth for All. How the story ends is up to you. Join earthforall.life Global Film is a group of scientists, humanists, educators, It's irritating that humanity has not listened to us, but they haven't. The warning bells were there already 50 years ago. The big difference is that now we truly are in the midst of the crises. We are much, much closer to, um, to potentially catastrophic outcomes. Now we have a short opportunity where everything is up in the air. We thought it was the time to now reassess to see what does science tell us today and how does the future look like the next 50 years. We have to change the story. We have to provide a plausible, coherent, consistent and also science-based and numbers-backed story that people find more attractive than business as usual. We have one scenario called too little, too late. And then the other one is where we succeed in putting all those possibilities together. We are proposing five turnarounds paid for by the 10% richest people in the world. If we put in place the five turnarounds that we talk about, the focusing on inequality, the focus on poverty, the focus on empowerment, and then food and energy as the two key resources that will keep us alive, as we're faced with some of these ongoing crises, then we actually could get ourselves out of this mess. And the interesting thing with these five turnarounds is that they can be scaled from communities to cities to sectors, nations, regions, and then globally. That's what we were looking for, like a fractal, set of fractals that escalate or percolate down from the global economic system all the way down to specific communities.
we need to start with redressing, making sure that the solution is fair, is perceived as fair by a democratic majority. Unless we do so, we won't get a solution. It's critical we talk about poverty because the poorest in societies um, are the most vulnerable and face the biggest risks, as we can see with the, the flooding in Pakistan, and we can see with the food crisis in sub-Saharan Africa. It's absolutely critical that um, we use this as an opportunity to, um, to spur um, sustainable economic development. We need to start to address population growth. And in addressing population growth, we need to ensure that men also empower women and that women then and girls can have access to education, that they can be part of the decision-making process and start to feel fulfilled in their lives in order to ensure that then population numbers will start to reduce. In the food system, we would see a rapid change towards uh, more logistics that reduce the unnecessary food waste and food loss so that we have food security. I'm absolutely convinced that the Ukraine war will help us to accelerate the transition away from oil, coal and natural gas. So we could see an energy democracy where local sources, microgrids, local areas don't have to rely so much on the global fossil energy system. What we're facing is not an environmental crisis. It's a crisis of, of security, of stability, of prosperity and equity. And, and, and that's what Earth for All really brings forward. What this book is trying to do is give some direction to policymakers to say if you actually implement these five key turnarounds with some of these very clear policy recommendations, we can start to see a difference. I'm fairly optimistic that we are going to see um, a very, very rapid transformation. But the question is, will it be fast enough? So the overall object of the latest report is basically to continue the fight. Now we need to come together and we need to share this image that a giant leap is fully possible. That comes back to a series of different structural shifts that we will have to make across the globe in order to ensure that we have truly an Earth for all. The world has never been so rich, but we're still susceptible to shocks and crises.
Now, do you have any audio now? You should. In the last few years, she, and indeed all of us, have met people who will live well into the 22nd century. <coughs> Think about how much time is touched by people who actually know firsthand. I think about that every day. We have a fantastic program lined up today. A little later on, we're going to hear from impact leaders who represent the Earth's land and water and the inhabitants of the Earth, both humans and the Christians, make us some rich and vital. But first, we're going to give you a glimpse into the huge amount of work that has gone into and been distilled into the Earth for All book, which looks like this, and we will all get a copy later on. The German translation is already number four on the German non-fiction bestseller list, which is fantastic. Many Thank you. 
supposedly saw with the carpentry, and somehow all that has been distilled. We have good news to share as part of this. The rest of the Scotland and Song Green Dixon Club will take us through what we need to do and how we can work together to, to deliver a just and inclusive Earth for all. But we must act urgently and purposefully now and our societies face clear and present danger. So we're going to start with a dose of reality from Johan Wastra. Who understands these threats, I think, as well as anyone on the panel. So the dark part comes first. Go ahead. Let me bring you to the light. I'll stand up because I will see. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's such an attractive role to come in with, with a, in the dark night. But um, I'd like to um, give you a scientific update, but to do it very much in line with what we set out to do with the World for All initiative. This is the 50th anniversary of the very famous Limited Growth Report that the Club of Rome facilitated and led together with MIT Systems Dynamic Models that came out in 1972. As you may recall, that report predicted that one potential scenario was that if we continue business as usual, which we actually did throughout the whole reign, actually, of Queen Elizabeth II, because she was born well before the end of the Anthropocene in the 1950s, then we had an exponential rise of pressures on the planet. And if we continued in that pathway, the Club of Rome report showed in one of the scenarios that we would start having a drawdown of the global economy sometime in the 2020s. Well, dear friends, that's where we are. And we have, in the midst of the disaster of Pakistan, with one third of the country under water, 1,500 people dead, with a price tag probably of the order of one trillion US dollars. Well, the world economy is roughly $100 trillion. So you have a 1% abrupt extreme event. And I could go on and use the seven minutes I have just to list what's happening in the Horn of Africa, the 200 million people marching towards starvation after five consecutive years of droughts in, in Kenya, Ethiopia, Eritrea. You have the fire, first fires in California, you have the exponential rise in the heat and fires in Europe, and so on and so forth. So it's starting to hit back. Planet Earth is sending invoices at an unprecedented scale right into the world economy. So it's time to really get concerned. Well, the deeper concern comes out of the science over the past 30 years. And just to give you a summary of the entry point into the Earth for all. Number one is that we have into the Anthropocene. We are now a predominant force of change on planet Earth. We exceed all forces of change from you know solar orbital forcing or volcanic eruptions or earthquake, we are now in the driving seat running the planet. We are at least that the planet. In the latest science that just came out two weeks ago, we show uh, for the first time that 1.5 degrees Celsius of global mean surface temperature rise. We are at 1.3 today. The warmest temperature on Earth since we left the last ice age. So just to remind us, we have already crashed through the warmest temperature on Earth since we left the last ice age for about years ago. And we show now that 1.5 degrees Celsius is, is a real climate planetary boundary. It has very strong scientific meaning in the sense that go past it and we likely cross four to five of the big tipping point system that we know not only regulates the stability of this planet, but also is directly linked to prosperity, equity, and uh, our own human well-being. And which are these four to five then? Well, number one is the Green Ice Sheet. Number two is the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. These two together hold 10, 10 meters sea level rise, and they are likely to be crossed irreversibly at 1.5. Then you have the tropical coral reef system, which I call victim number one of global warming, because they are very likely to be lost at 1.5. And then you have the boreal permafrost system that I risk of abrupt growing, which is a feedback that will just amplify the warming even further. And finally, is the question of the Bering Sea ice overturning the heat and, and the regional weather regulation. This is the first set of tipping point systems that are very likely going to cost the people at 1.5, and we have 1.3. The window to hold us to a manageable future is so narrow. So now is the time to really transform. And I said, that is not enough, as a kind of a challenge, that the charge of the Earth goes well beyond that. 
Because the reason why they According to exactly what science stipulates, cutting emissions by half every decade for the net zero will occur by 2050, we would still <coughs> fail. Why? Because we're transgressing the boundaries of biodiversity, on fresh water, on nitrogen, on phosphorus, and on deforestation. So the nature boundaries would themselves push us across the 1.5 line. And this is also well established in science. So there's no choice. We need a transformation. We need an exponential journey towards a safe and just landing within a manageable, resilient planet for all. And that's the Earth for all. And there we have the answers. They will come to us <laughs> with beautiful flowers and happiness. Over to you, Brandon. <laughs>
the magnitude or the amount of money it needed to, 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 to be moved. Um, so let me give you a few numbers. I mean, you're fine now, right? So you're ready. And, and I was like, what's, you know, what's the one million dollar question? And no, no, the one million dollar of the house in New Delhi, and she points out that uh, the current finance system does not provide policy space to low-income country governments. They are very restricted in terms of their financial freedom, in terms of um, what they are able to uh, get of finance, the interest rates, and uh, not least constrained by patents and trade systems that go against innovation and value creation and jobs in their countries. So we need a jobs and energy driven growth to solve poverty. And we need to shift about one to two trillion dollars into new policy space in addition to debt elimination in those countries that have lo lo less than $10,000 per person per year. We have Four billion people, or what we've learned from Montella and Montella, uh, we should not speak about the north and the south. We shouldn't really speak about the developed world versus the developing world. We should speak about most of the world. And most of the world are four billion people living on below four dollars per day. How would that be to survive on four dollars or two dollars or one dollar per day? And that's the issue we're up against. So we need one to two trillion dollars annually increase in the policy space to create green and inclusive jobs to do something with us. That was the first. The second, inequality. Today, about $10 trillion are shifted in global transfers through governments to low income, whether it's through health services or it's, um, it's um, particularly um, social transfers. And in order to get, generate a giant leap in all the world's 10 major regions, you have to double or triple that. So our suggestion is to take a little fraction of the income of the top 10 percent richest. They control about 50 percent of the income, so that's 50 trillion dollars. So a few percentages of that is enough to shift the world to a total level of inequality. And now time is running out, so I can't go deep on that. Empowerment. <laughs> Five trillion dollars is spent on education. How much of that do you think goes to women in low-income countries? Five to ten percent at best. Ten percent in all low-income countries, and <coughs> half of that to women. So, fraction goes to where it needs to go, and the benefits there are incredible. So, if we educate all women and they get access to jobs, suddenly we have a ten to fifteen, maybe even twenty trillion net gain to the global economy. That's the ultimate boost to GDP per person growth, is that we get access to education and work. Or it could be spent two to three hundred billion dollars on subsidizing food that destroys the planet. We can shift that, or we can add the same amount in subsidies for regenerative and sustainable agriculture. And the last energy. Um, we spend about $5 trillion annually in direct and indirect subsidies to the energy uh, industry. If we shifted a little bit of that towards increasing the annual investment in renewable energy from about $300 billion to, let's say, one to one, one, one and a half trillion dollars per year, that would be on track to achieve what you want as the 1.5 carbon law. So this is the issue, right? We need to move those trillions. How are we going to do that, Sandy? <laughs> so how are we going to move the trillions? And how are we going to inspire people when they actually read this book to be part of the trillions? I think that would be what we want to do. Not only to simplify and to simplify our findings, but to make them encompassing of 
everything else, so that everyone can find their place in this story. The novelty of this is actually threefold. The first is that we did try, with Jayati and many others, to set up a transformational economics commission of scientists and economists across the globe that can stress test the findings, bring it back to where they were, and bring it out to us to even understand what is the situation on the ground, not just get so caught up in the modeling that we're actually separate from what's happening every day in their lives, what they're saying where they are. Because it was important for us to make sure that most of the world felt that they were part of this book, not just three Caucasian from Europe with one book. <laughs> that was very important. Novelty number one. Novelty number two, it is not environmental tipping points that are a great existential risk. It is the social tipping points. That is what came out so firmly. It is absolutely fundamental that we get those first three tipping points right, that we get those first turnarounds. And the focus <coughs> has to be on those three, poverty, inequality, and empowerment, in order for us to ensure that we do live within the planetary boundaries. That was novelty number two, and that's fundamental as we sit here during Climate Week and I'm done, and as we go to COP, to remember the link between poverty, inequality, and climate change it's not technology people that are going to solve the problem. Shifting the trillions to technology answers are not what's going to get us out of this mess. It's understanding innovation in governance. It's understanding innovation in the politics that start to service people, planet, and prosperity at the same time. That shift us from the compound effects of those tipping points that we're seeing today. That's novelty number two. Novelty number three is we decided we could not be the only storytellers. We had to bring in four women <coughs> from across the globe, seeing from their eyes the shift between two scenarios. The too little, too late scenario, <coughs> where actually population growth continues at a rate which will not be acceptable within the planetary boundaries, that the temperature continues to get to a level where we know, and you already see it now, we are going to be at increasing crisis point, 2.5 degrees. And, and then the giant leap scenario, where we can stay within the planetary boundaries, where we can innovate, again, not only look at technology solutions, <coughs> but address poverty, address inequality, by making sure that at least those low-income countries can guarantee $15,000 salaries to their people per hour. That we can actually look at special drawing marks, that we can look at debt cancellation as a real option, in particular now, as we see the issues of the compound effects of the three Cs, COVID, climate, and conflict. That we start to look at the wealthiest in society, and for those of you who are in finance, to understand that the over-financialization of the economy is not servicing people. It's not servicing the planet, and it's definitely not servicing prosperity. The over-financialization of the economy demonstrates that shareholder value comes before people. That you can fire 10,000 people and your shares can still go up. That's a dysfunctionality within our current economy. What we try to say through those two deep scenarios is that if you take the giant leap and if you imply that you can actually put those five turnarounds in place, which we think you can, only two to four percent GDP per hour, to actually translate this into reality so that we can shift from a GDP economy from a growth and extractive economy into a well-being economy. That's the vision. That's the future. That future vision and the solutions that we have, we have now moved from a book to a movement. <coughs> a movement that encompasses the journey that we all need to join in our own ways, but also by holding each of us accountable, by holding our governance accountable, by holding businesses accountable and holding the financial sector accountable, 
Because at the end of the day, as Sharon Burrow is one of those commissioners that sat with us, head of the Trade Union Confederation, so clearly says, there are no jobs on a dead plan. There's no stock market on a dead plan. None of us will survive the temperatures that we are facing if we continue to not think about an Earth for all. That's why this is the survival of Earth and Energy. But it's usually people only looking for larger scale solutions. And so there's this chicken and egg gap is how can you actually get to the larger scale? So now we're fun things earlier. So I'm just curious if there's any thoughts on how just taking other people in the Finance community might be able to help solve that problem. So I can give a short comment and then the next question. So uh, I happen to be an entrepreneur myself. So I've done my round. where we see that unless we get a uh, government that is willing to become entrepreneurial. And then that, again, depends on the level of social trust. Because if government goes alone and the public has no trust in government, then we will not have entrepreneurial thrust and speed. So this is part of the transformational economics work that we're building on the uh, mission approach at, of uh, Mariano Mazzucato, for instance. And one of the uniquenesses of this model is that you can have a look at the uh, active state, how active and how big these missions have to become if you are to achieve the sufficient rate of change in technology across the economy. But that only is possible uh, as long as the government is able to keep its legitimacy among its citizens. So that dynamic between the mission and the social trust that's the one you have to have a look at. And we're experimenting with different versions of that in the moment. And you can play with it too if you want. Can I just add to yeah. the, that question and not then I'll build hopefully on the next question? Um, there's been a great deal of discussion within the philanthropy um, community to see how they can kickstart projects at much smaller um, levels. And, and this is coming up continuously. So I do think that there is a real shift, especially as we're noticing as well, community projects typically are smaller, um, and some conservation projects as well. That discussion, though, truly needs to match supply and demand. And often the problem is that the philanthropists don't know the projects. So there is some new thinking. Active philanthropy, for example, is creating a holding base for a series of projects. Where it will all be online. And, uh, and that is so that they can start to match supply and demand. Good. Absolutely. So, another question, please. I would have mind so much a question. My name is Maria Rodrigo. I'm including my questions. Um, and, you know, my point is to uh, Sorry, entrepreneurship, etc., etc. 
but generally you have to change your mindsets. You're giving us the evidence, yes, but are people really listening? Are they changing their mindsets? And this is the reason why Bradford was saying, all you do is blah, blah, blah. Because we're talking all the time, but our mindsets are changing. So how do we begin to work with each other in a way that we begin to shift this mindset? So that when we're moving this trillions of dollars, it's actually going to change. My second point that I want you to look at is this is this real empowerment. It's being redundant. Why are we happy? Do we really want to empower you to be one who has the power to move and change things? So those are the two points I need. Thank you. Also, I think you haven't showed this. 
So we cannot wait for a completely new economic paradigm in the world. We cannot wait for everyone to have climbed out of their closets. So we have to move with the, with the current system and make it work. That's why we, we list all these uh, policy measures and correct market failures, for example. And that is within the old paradigm, I agree. But it's kind of part of a thinking in dual terms. It's kind of both paradigm shifts and operating within the current system. And, and we believe that that is the way to go. And why that approach as well is because there's so much evidence, which also some good points out, that if we succeed, we will have much better outcomes for you know, both the economy, of course, but also for, for equity and for health and for security. So there's a very, you, you, could, you could say with a high degree of, uh, you know, it's an interesting hypothesis, but it's more than a hypothesis that if you really, really start succeeding on the sustainability turnaround, you're, you're likely to get a, a ball rolling that, that starts self-perpetuating in the right direction. So of course that would almost be like self-creating that mindset. So I think there's, um, there's some tactics here to learn. Yeah. Building on that mindset shift, I think it was a perfect question because the other thing that um, we do need to be honest about, there are about 30 contributors, some of those commissioners that are part of our discussions. And let's remember, and in fact, the, the privilege of being at the public realm is that we have always honored different thought leadership and theories of change. And there are many who did not agree with some of the deep paradigm shifts that we are putting here, but felt that it was all about mindset shift. And there are others who felt that actually we needed to do the paradigm shift first and then others would join the journey. I think there's several aspects to this. There are other discussions that are happening around how do you create that mindset shift? And conversations with one of our commissioners, actually, who will come out with a new book, very much showing that societal addiction with consumption and growth cannot be treated in the way in which we're treating it now with regard to climate narratives. What he clearly says is individual addiction and therapies for individual addiction should be used for societal therapy, which is creating that vision that there is another future. And so in that sense, I think we've done the right thing. What we're trying to do here is show there is another way. And we can get there. The idea of the movement is then to build on that, to have citizen assemblies, to work with governments, to show them not only the policy recommendations, but also help them so they don't get caught with their pants down. When they've got the credits who are saying, what the hell are you doing? That's our responsibility. And that's how we feel that sense of responsibility, that it is time to work together to give another vision. But we also have to show that accountability principle. So that's, that's the first. And giving some, we didn't talk about universal basic dividend for the citizen fund, which is a novel idea of how we redistribute wealth. And it's already been done in Norway and also in Alaska, for example. With regard to the governments, there are governments that are actually putting in place well-being indicators that have decided that they're moving beyond GDP. That's Finland, New Zealand, Scotland, um, Iceland, and Wales. And those governments actually coming out of COVID were much more resilient. But why were they also resilient to criticism from people and citizens? Because they communicated with the citizens differently. And that's also part of the message that we try to give, which is communication has to change. We need to start being honest about the current prospect of our economic dysfunctionality, and we need to be honest about the possibilities of that future vision It'll get harder before it gets better, but together, hopefully, we can get there. Um, yeah, we have a question. Okay, let's do a question. They wrote the lead one, and then we'll get two questions. In, hold on, Kenny Crawley, do you want to answer that one? Uh, yeah, but I see time from you. Well, we're good on time. Okay. <laughs> no, it's an but, important. Yeah, it, it connects to two things. Uh, the issue of, of inclusiveness in terms of uh, ethnicity and color, and also uh, this word of empowerment that you were focusing on. We struggle so much with that. You have no idea. We all struggle with it. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, but um, when we say empowerment of women, we let resistance, not least from some of our African members, because what you don't need is 
um, forgetting about the men and pushing them uh, too much to women, and then you get a toxic masculinity hitting back. Uh, that's not what we're speaking about. We're speaking about a gender equity issue. And that is also across, across uh, race and ethnicity. So um, I also want to pick up one more thing that says we get the word to be a total Greta, because there's also a generational split between the young and the elder generation, which is equally important. And I fully understand the young generation's frustration, their fear and their outrage, and the willingness to say blah, blah, blah. But on the other hand, I mean, that's the job of youth. Uh, but doing that always means you're not really recognizing how many people are actually stepping up and how many solutions actually are emerging, how many investors are actually changing, how many companies have started to transition. So suddenly, all that work that millions of NGOs and companies and associations are doing all over the world becomes invisible because the media prefers to do the apocalyptic stories and the collapse stories and the globalization. It does not represent that millions and, and, and billions of actions currently happening. So I told that to be uh, Actually, we have a new book coming out where I think both you and I are writing chapters along, and I'm taking that issue up to Gerda. Uh, that it is understandable that they are angry, and when you do that, you do not see the extent of the mindset shift that has begun. And I think we should at least speak about three times as much about all the opportunities and the things that are happening in the world as we speak about the threats and how little is happening. So that's part of that narrative change. So let me then defend the other. So I mean, I think it is important just to have there are two, two dimensions. I mean, her frustration in Mexico was that politicians promise and they don't deliver. And, and that is different to the fact that you have so many good examples of action from different actors on the world, where things are not adding up globally, and the countries are promising things, and they're not delivering. That's the frustration. And I think that is something that we should not necessarily mix with mindset, because that can be operating within our current system. I mean, delivering within our current system is about cutting global emissions by half a decade. Just do it. Just do it. And then that was her frustration there, and I, I think one should stand by that. And uh, so it's, I think it's a kind of a, both parts can be put in the same book. So <laughs> this perfectly illustrates, can you imagine having 30 thought leaders <laughs> everybody in the same room trying to, you know, get the arguments across? So it's been... Okay, two more questions and then we close. Uh, first, you, uh, yeah, just behind that. And then that's my box. Yeah, and then, yeah. Please. Yeah, keep it close to the mouth. First of all, thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, I know that it always makes sense. But I was going to say, um, I think that change management is, change management is the real issue here. Um, I'm a big student of that, because I think how to make everyone change is as important as the details of why we need, we need to change. And the thing that struck me, as you said, it's not about developed or developing countries, et cetera, et cetera. We gave the $1, $2, and of course, you all thought we're sitting in New York City. My biggest thought is, is that we sit here in the United States. The equity market is $44 trillion. That's a huge part of what we're talking about needs to be done. Um, the low income or poverty part of this nation has risen by 4%. Middle class has declined by 10 as well, and the upper class has risen by 6%. The VC community has only given 2.7% of its money to women, and 1.7% to people of color as well. The data is brutal here on all of the things you're talking about. How do we get Americans to change before we try to change the world? <laughs> and if you've got a good idea, I'm American. I'm all with you. Please call me. I'm happy to try. And that's my day. So I'm going to call that day. All the way back to the uh, stairs. Okay, and there was a gentleman right. there. Okay. Okay. We'll back okay. in the second part. Nigel, you have to come up. And Doug has to come up and break us off at some point. I'm going to do that after this question. Okay. <laughs>
Uh, I'm be speedy. I know we're running a little tight. Please. Ian Monroe with Ethel Capital and Stanford University, and we partnered with New Day on the climate action strategy that they run. So we, along with New Day and a number of others, and invite anybody else in this room interested, are helping launch a new climate positive investing alliance that is really trying to unite investors who are serious about taking climate action and getting in portfolios well beyond net zero to net kind of positive much, much faster than 2050. One of the things that we've been working on trying to incorporate it into the membership pledge is something related to basically all the for all principles. How do we ensure that climate investing is not trampling on indigenous rights, on diversity, equity, inclusion, justice initiatives, and all the different pieces we talked about? So if you were to craft a single line, ideally, that all investors who are serious about taking climate action would sign on to, what would you want that to be? What do you want those of us who are serious about climate action to also be pledging to do in terms of the overall framework that you're proposing with Earth for All? Oh, go ahead. I've got one. Briefly, uh, I think we have to stop the American habit of looking for a single bullet to solve everything, the one thing we have. So we need a single buckshot, and we need 15 of them on page uh, 170. That's the problem with doing systems thinking. A system is complex and it changes one parameter, it doesn't go all the way through because a system tends to regenerate the structure rather than being changed. So we have to do a lot of things all the time to avoid the system regenerating its own habitual behaviors. And that's why we need at least five and possibly 15 dollars to have that system change. Please. Our Earth shot is zero carbon, zero poverty, zero inequality, zero biodiversity now. We now do not concretize that a little bit more than just to say, what does zero really mean? I think my advice to, to anyone sitting, as you're doing, is to, to advise that from now on, we can no longer allow any loss of impact nature. So it means any investment in any kind of offsetting is not allowed anymore <clears throat> because you have to simply get off fossil fuel, get to zero, and you have to keep, keep nature intact, zero loss. And these two are, are two very hard guided principles which kind of collide actually with a lot of thinking because this is so attractive for uh, companies and financial institutions to, to try and kind of uh, tactically compensate the inability of phasing out fossil fuels with investments in different kind of nature climate solutions and doing it in an in, in a, in a <coughs> unscientific offsetting manner. And, and this is something that we have to help each other work together on, on, on kind of tidying up. And then finally, just on, on the US, I, I think uh, what, what the US has to do is, is in a way quite simple. It has to learn a bit more, not, not necessarily going as far as Earth for All in terms of, of uh, wealth redistribution, but, but there has to be uh, a stronger social contract and responsibility for all those in the US that are losing. I mean, if you look at the last 20 years in the US, just as you say, the average households in the US are going backwards, not forward. And of course, that is what's causing a lot of the polarization in the country. And I think there's a lot to learn from, from uh, for example, the Nordic region and, and, and you know some parts of the world that have been trying hold off for this polarization, which by the way is not hitting these countries as well. So we're in a very difficult situation, sliding, moving along the US pathway also in some of the countries, but having to try to fight off that, that inability of holding off uh, that discrepancy between the and the Thank you. Actually, we have to one last thing, and that is I'd like to mention special thanks to the uh, Angela White Bandit Foundation. Yes. Who yes. is in this room now and help this project get going? Without your help, we do not. So, thank you very much. We are going to have a change now to bring Doug Heskey, Heskey and his colleagues out. Please thank you.
just as, as the guest list of our microphones on the chair, and I'm glad to welcome your guests up, and they can get set with a nice one. And you know, maybe whilst they're doing that, I'll just make a couple of very quick comments. Firstly, if there are any questions from the live stream, please do uh, please do bring this question we try to work those in. We know that the audio quality is extremely somewhat patchy. Apologies for that. There will be recording after but the audio will be much better. Uh, these glitches can happen. And just as this is what gets set up for this session, uh, and everybody gets their minds lined up, I think that the interesting thing to think about the whole point of this session, which comes now, is that the solutions we need for most of what we need to do, we have today. We don't need new technology for many of those things. And part of the point of this session is to be able to see what's happening in real life. Ian, first of all, I want to thank you for your thoughts. Um, admirable efforts. Okay, and New Day is very pleased to be a part of what you're pulling together. We could not be moving any faster. Right now. So I think very critical for all of us again. Um, it's an amazing week for us. So we start today with the Earth for All book launch. The project we are concluding this week with a listing of our second exchange traded fund on the New York Stock Exchange as a symbol STGS and have a number of people from our youth community as a part of these organizations who are good friends and partners that will be joining us up on the podium on Friday. So it is both fitting and humbling to be sitting here on the stage with all of you given that this is an incredibly important event in New York. Not only is this the first day of climate action week, but we're in the middle of the 78th General Assembly, and one that is being held during a period of time whereby we are facing major social and environmental degradation. The theme for this year's conference at the UN is Watershed Moment, Transformative Solutions to Interlocking Challenges. Earth for All has now given us a blueprint for how we ought to address these challenges. While we understand what should be done, one of the biggest challenges that we have as a society is bridging this chasm between action, or between awareness and action. And the paradox today is that the people that are on the very forefront of climate impact, at least in their own minds, don't necessarily recognize that the small carbon footprints that they have can make a meaningful difference. But the time has changed for all of us to be aware of the fact that we all have to pitch in to save the planet. And this is why we're here today. So it is not by coincidence that we are joined by this incredible group of distinguished impact leaders all addressing these interlocking challenges. Each of you are doing incredibly important work tackling the problems of conservation, ocean health, clean water, and education and skill development through the work that you're doing at Gen U and UNICEF. All of you have chosen in some regards to focus on the youth community, your younger members of our generation, because it's so important to our future as we are breeding, raising, cultivating the leaders of tomorrow. And this month is truly a watershed month as climate change and other associated challenges are now accelerating and accelerating rapidly. Accelerating rapidly. Economic costs, as we discussed today, may exceed more than two trillion dollars a year just here in the U.S. And fixing this problem will cost hundreds of billions. Of Certainly, um, events like Iman Shinard's gift to fight climate change will have a meaningful impact on that, but there needs to be a lot more. These costs can be financed through a combination of innovative financial tools, some of which are being employed in your organizations today. And while critical capital is a critical component of what we're doing, there's so many other things that are essential to solving the problem around advocacy, around using your shareholder voices to encourage organizations to change. And we ourselves at New Day just have to recognize that true impact is made not just through investment 
it's fatal to the plane design. But by using capitalism for some change, in driving consumer behavior, and investing in the area of prediction. And as we like to say, capital plus advocacy equals impact. This afternoon, we'd like to explore some of the innovative ways in which capital is being put to work for good. Joining us this afternoon are Anna Rathman, the Executive Director of the Jane Goodall Institute, a global organization committed to inspiring people to serve our national world. Philippe Gusto, who's beaming in from California, founder of Earth Economic International, who is building a global youth movement to protect and restore the living Georgie Bell, Bell, Bell Liberty, founder of the Georgie Bell Foundation. GBF is a partner of New Days in doing amazing work associated with well restoration and women's empowerment in Georgie's home country, Burkina Faso. And Nadi Alpino, uh, Deputy Director of Partnerships for UNICEF Generation of Women. So, Nadi, I'd like to start with you. We've talked about this idea of using capital as a force for good. Certainly, Generation Unlimited is doing powerful things in the youth community, empowering tens of millions of younger people who go out and take actions. And in fact, associated with our own exchange traded fund launch, a portion of our revenues will be going back to support the JNU initiative. Can you talk a bit more about what you're doing at JNU and why this work ends up kind of so important? Thank you very much. I think, first and foremost, I'd like to say that. Do not empower people. I think that's 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 the core of what we call ourselves a public private function. And it's powered by your community. We have the ideas, we have the solutions, how to do it. I come from the continent of Africa. Seventy percent of our population is under the age of thirty-five. Globally, I think it's close to forty percent or more of the population. So I think when we talk about generational uh, divide, it's not just a question of teenagers going out and counting about the future, and worrying about what the future they're going to inherit is going to be like. But we're talking about 20 year olds and 30 year olds and 55 year olds who are living in this world today, who are the leaders in of themselves, who understand the systems that we work with, and who can be the disruptors that we my biggest challenge is that we don't work, we don't work with young people as if they too understand that the challenge of this world they deal with. I think that we talk too much in a pop up now with the same leaders of tomorrow. You know, we 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 are uh, we are skilling you for future jobs, uh, the future green jobs, it's not the future, it's here and now we put the science. And this skills we need to now. We understand what those skills are. We understand what those jobs are. And those are the kind of things that we find to How do we work with these young people? Draw in these ideas that we have in solutions and then mobilize the capital around the world so that we can invest in these ideas and solutions so that young people can help us to find this way back. I think that's the fundamental thing that we're trying to do with the generation. That we have with you know, we agriculture, we looking at entrepreneurship, green entrepreneurship, how we work with that. We're working with you know big pockets now and, and, and foundations, etc. So how we develop really practical programs in countries that can help young people come up and do the kind of things that need to change the world. I think we cannot depend on politicians anymore. I think we cannot depend on systems anymore. Some time ago, 
that you wanted a seat at both tables. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and how Earth Echo is, is addressing the capital question today? Well, thank you, thank you Jeremy, for having me be a part of this, uh, this wonderful event. And of course, all in this wonderful week and all the terrific work that you did has been done doing. Um, we're thrilled to be a partner now in a few years and very excited about um, uh, our work. Uh, what I meant by sitting at two tables, both tables, you know, it's, it's about uh, 13 years ago now that I was at the Global Initiative, and they were talking about um, the size of global financial markets and the size of charitable giving, and the disparity between the two, and it was at that point where I realized that, you know, we really need to look at market-based solutions as much as we look at charitable solutions uh, to, uh, to these problems. Um, and so I've been involved in financial markets now for a while, um, but continuing to pursue my work for that go as well. Uh, the, the other big piece that, you know, and, and, and uh, you touched on it a few times, that we have overlooked and underdressed in the environmental movement is education. And the sense that, in my opinion, we have very much focused on tactical solutions to the environmental crisis. Uh, my grandfather talked about this decades ago when he said, and before we talk about conservation, we have to talk about education. And what you realize is that the way we create systemic change in society that can drive the long-term durable, and that's very important, the durable support for conservation is through education. So often we have been focused on short-term fixes, trying to protect land, pass a law, whatever it may be. But if I've seen over and over in my career, as my grandfather and father, that members of our family have witnessed, uh, one, I remember uh, one head of a very large environmental NGO came to me lamenting one time, you know, the problem is we put some land aside in the conservation pantry, and then the next politician comes along from a different party and decides that they want to take it out of the conservation pantry, so to speak. And so um, until you build and invest in creating a, a strategic approach and a durable approach to conservation for building a society that cares, we're not going to see the long-term support and shift for the kinds of real innovative systemic changes that we need. We've seen this uh, one great example uh, recently, which we're you know, finally starting to see that shift in the part of the uh, uh, work of a lot of scrappy organizations like the ones here on this panel and myself and, and others, but over the years working with, uh, frankly, the pittance of charitable giving to do this kind of work, tiny fraction of charitable giving goes to the environment, and even more less than that, of course, goes to the, goes to the ocean and into education. Um, and what we found in the most recent election is that finally for a new generation, you look at a motivating factors for them from their voting perspective and their voting behavior, and climbing is one of those issues. And in a recent study that came out just before the last presidential election, it found it looked at what states in the United States where young people have the most potential to, to uh, uh, affect the outcome of the election. And indeed, it was young people in swing states like Pennsylvania, um, uh, in Michigan, and uh, in Florida. And so, what we have underinvested in, and I think neglected our own peril, is how we invest in education and building society that cares about these kind of issues and that support. Builds durability for the kind of political and economic changes that we need. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we do at Rebecca. We focus on the ocean. I should also just give a shout out to the ocean. We continue to talk about terrestrial solutions to the climate crisis. We need to focus more on ocean based solutions to the climate crisis. One mangrove forest can absorb you know, four to five times more carbon than a terrestrial forest. Seagrasses, kelp forests, we grow two feet in a day. So um, I just want to throw in a quick shout. I wouldn't be a few so I without saying uh, the importance that we have neglected uh, coastal and marine and ocean ecosystems are our, our greatest allies in, um, uh, in fighting this, this crisis. And also, in many cases, the kelp forests, for example, providing good sustainable jobs for local communities that can't be outsourced. So um, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there because I know we should look at that. Philippe, uh, thank you very much, and we'll come back to you in just a moment. I would like to call out that none of the individuals that are in Spain are, are shy to collaborate. So Philippe and Georgie and Anna and others have participated with one another on podcasts in support of all of the work that their respective organizations do. So I would like to turn to Georgie 
And Georgie probably needs little introduction. She was the former Miss Burkina Faso, former Miss Africa. But most importantly, she turned a very successful modeling career into one where she became a successful social entrepreneur, setting up the Georgie Bedell Foundation to benefit her home country of Burkina Faso. Uh, we had one constituent mention to us that Georgie's work is the true definition of sustainability. So Georgie, you are doing amazing things. Please share with us the work of GBF and now what you're doing on a number of very important water projects and how you're allocating capital to those projects as well. Absolutely. <coughs> it's an honor to be here. Um, I actually started the Georgie Bagel Foundation not because I wanted to have an organization because it was uh, so much needed. Um, as a young girl, I used to walk three hours to fetch water with my grandma and my cousin girls. Uh, fetching water wasn't something that I liked because I am not a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> so every morning, my grandmother would come at the door, knock, knock, Georgie, let's go get the water. And uh, I was mad. I would go uh, behind the house, cry for 30 minutes, come back, get my bucket, and before walking, I uh, get the water. Um, as I grow, I was blessed to become. Uh, Miss Burkina Faso in 2003, uh, following that, uh, Miss Africa. Um, after that great success, I would say, I was again blessed to go to Paris to start an international modeling career. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, living in Paris is so amazing. You know, I could take a bubble bath anytime I wanted. <laughs> Uh, showers and um, life is beautiful. Until I went back home to visit my sister who was almost nine months pregnant. And my sister has to wake up between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. to get home. That is when I knew that the system is completely broken. And I felt straight in freedom because um, as a kid, we used to do that. And now, we, we, she's a woman, a woman. Uh, my sister has to, to do it. So I came back to New York and I met with a friend, a model friend. Uh, I, I tell her about my trip, I was mad, I was furious. She said, you start an organization. Like an organization, we don't have time, I'm not sure if that can help, let's do it. Uh, we started this movement called uh, Models for Women. And with that organization, 100% of the funds we were raising were going through other organizations so that they can build wells in Africa, whatever they want. Um, some of these organizations wouldn't work in my grandmother village. And at some point, um, we realized that we wanted to do good, but it was actually a full time job. We couldn't be models <laughs> on the runway. And at the UN at the same time. <laughs> so my friend decided to um, uh, stop her uh, uh, minutes for water. I was completely heartbroken. I said, uh, my grandmother village still don't have access to clean water, so what do I do? So I decided to share my childhood story um, with Bingo, uh, uh, which for the deal I bought with uh, New York Times bestselling authors. Uh, Susan Bell and he was able to um, create the water princess. So I said, you know what, 100% of my book funds would go to um, access to clean water and uh, they would build the first well in my grandmother village. I was so excited. So we found an organization, we gave the money to that organization, and it was so much money that they could have built almost three wells if they wanted. But I wanted that only one more, and I was going to raise more money for that organization. That organization took the money. They went to my grandmother village, and they came back with the excuse that, oh, we don't know how they would take care of the well. So they did not build the well in my grandmother village. Again, I got um, very frustrated. I said, I am going to stand up and start my own organization. That is actually how the Georgie Bagel Foundation uh, was um, born. Uh, I felt 
felt that if I don't stand up uh, for the people of my country, uh, we will not be able to break the cycle of, of the war princesses. Uh, so in uh, seven years, we were able to bring access to clean drinking water to over 300,000 people. But most importantly, um, the Georgie Badia Foundation, at the beginning, when I started the organization, I would go to some villages and I would see that there was a well. And women still have to walk two hours, three hours away from uh, their village to get water. And I couldn't understand uh, why. And um, the argument was that, oh, we don't know how to fix it. The only person, the only people that knew how to fix it was like one man or two that the government actually trained to fix it when it was broken, but they were asking so much money uh, to this woman that they could, the community couldn't afford them. So I said, you know what, I'm going to start to train women uh, to fix this well. And so far we were able to train um, over 178 women, uh, basic engineering, because building wells is engineering, and, um, and transforming life. I also 
want to recognize Nigel Bacon Potter, the incredible work that they've done. Thank you so very much for being here today. I know the audio quality was not what we had hoped for, but there will be a recording available afterwards separately, which should have much better sound. Thank you very much indeed.